All right. Excuse me. We go ahead and get started here. Um, I did finish putting grades to everybody's quizzes yet, but I, I glanced at them enough to look at everybody's questions to make sure we could address those. I got, I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole because the, I had plans for what periodic table we were gonna put in the new, in the new chem labs when they were done. And I realized this morning that it's no longer in print. And so, and I'm kind of picky about my periodic tables, as, as you may or may not know. Um, and so I was went down a rabbit hole trying to find which one we're going to actually get next time. Um, and I'm open to suggestions if you if you have a particular favorite. Um, there used to be this really cool one, P table, the interactive one online. Did this really cool one that looked like a really simple one. You looked at it from from a bar um, in color, but when you got closer. The color shading in each box was a bunch of additional details like density and electronegativity. And so like it looked good from a long way away. You could see like the most important stuff like atomic mass and atomic number and stuff like that. And then when you got closer, you, there was even more details, um, which I really, I really liked that one, but I don't think they're making it anymore. Um, yeah, use P-table and Donna Curdle. Yeah, yeah, they're, it's pretty nice. It's, it's a really good PDF. They still have a really good PDF where you can pick and choose which layers are visible. It's probably, it's pretty good for your offline. Um, and then obviously their online version is, is amazing. Um, but anyway, um, so it's a question about multiple cyclic stru structures attached to each other. How would we name those? Um, that gets tricky because it depends on a little bit on what you, what you mean. If, if they're just attached like a branch, um, it's not so bad. For instance, you can have get yeah, this molecule. This is going to be cyclopentyl cyclohexane. So it sounds weird, and it may have a common name as well. But using our IUPAC rules. Our longest continuous carbon chain is cyclohexane. And then we have a cyclopentyl that we're going to name as a branch. So cyclopentyl, cyclohexane, um, or even if they're the same size, pick one and call it the dominant one. So cyclohexyl, cyclohexane, although I'm almost certain that one has a common name. Um, when they're fused together, when we say fused, basically when they're sharing one of the sides, then that's when things get weird. Um, and there is an IUPAC way of naming them like this, but almost always there's, this is going to be something that's going to have a common name. And so, um, and I don't know a lot of them off the top of my head because I don't deal with these molecules every day. So um, I would go draw a mole view and then see what mole view said for the information card. That might as well right now. There are other um, alternatives in Moldview as well. I just like Moldview because it's it runs pretty well. It pulls up the three D structures and it also pulls up the information cards pretty easily. Um, as opposed to a lot of the other ones are a lot are a little funkier. And so if we look at that and then just go over to tools, just pull up the information card. Hexahydroindin an ortho fused bicyclic hydrocarbon. Um, what's that? I got no feeling for next. Yeah, so if you make if you do it out of, out of aromatics, you're going to get something different. Um, and obviously, you know, caffeine is an example of fused uh, aromatic rings as well. Um, um, versus if we had, I think, <clears throat> to it. There's not a standardized nomenclature for the fused. I, I, there is, but I don't think it's commonly used enough um, because every case winds up being a little bit different. And there's, they're just, they're, frankly, they're not that common outside of, yeah, so that one is in fact cyclopentyl cyclohexane is the, is the name for, for this structure. Or... To... Bicyclohexyl. 
Um, and Moldy is not always perfect with the way it pulls up the names, but a lot of times at the very least have a link um, to something that's, um, there's a couple other sources that it will refer you to, um, PubChem or um, the NIST webbook for the, the two standards as, as a source there. But yeah, this one looks, here's to just be named by Cyclohexyl. And um, if you see it on PubChem or if you see it on um, the chemistry webbook, the NIST chemistry webbook, um, those are pretty reliable sources. They're a little bit like Wikipedia, but they're maintained a little bit more stringently even. And they also have links to other stuff. Like if you wanted to find the, um, See, this is probably an IR. No, that's a proton and arm. Um, you know, if you want to find various spectra, uh, you can. You know, it makes you try to get you to join these other services. I'm not showing. I guess that is the whole thing. Um, it's not usually watermarked. They've changed that in the last year. Anyway, um, starting from Moldview and then using Moldview's sources to get to things is a pretty good way of finding out what something's actually named too. If it's going to be something with a common name versus a, uh, an IUPAC name. Um, why does sea wax containing fluorine work so well and why is it banned from competitions now? Um, it's a, because essentially the ski waxes the use that were made with fluorines, or we mentioned, we talked about Teflon, right? That's basically the most slippery substance known to man. Um, ski waxes containing fluorine are not quite as big of a molecule as Teflon, but they're kind of like a wax form instead of like a solid plastic form. But they're very, very similar in terms of their properties. Um, my guess, I don't know why it's banned now, but my guess is because it's not commercially, it's not commercially available because for environmental concerns, and it's not commercially available, they have to ban it from competition. So this, if somebody had a stockpile of it from 10 years ago, they're not getting an unfair advantage if they're still using something that used to be allowed, used to be commercially available, and now isn't. Um, yeah, working at the ski shop for eight years, um, we work a lot to use high floral wax because of uh, like health too, because of the fumes. Oh yeah, and yeah, proper that people work working with it every day for sure. Yeah. Um, Supposedly it puts out toxic fumes. Well, especially in the wax form, because the wax form is going to evaporate and make, make particles a lot easier. If you have it in, this, in the real Teflon solid plastic form, yeah, it's still not great for you to get it in, in your body. Um, but for the most part, it's going to stay as particles rather than as a as a vapor. And because the vapors are going to get into your body a lot more pervasively and could be even, even more dangerous, or at least dangerous on a um on a faster time scale, um, especially chronically. So that, that would be my guess is that that's why it's not, it's banned from competition is because it's banned everywhere else. So, you know, don't give advantages to other people that just because they were able to stockpile or because otherwise you're, you're effectively, um, if you don't ban it from competitions, you're promoting a black market economy effectively, right? Um, just like with a lot of nutritional supplements that have been banned that, but, you can still find them, but if they're not, you know, you'll also have to test for them in competition so that they're not just allowing people that are willing to go to the black market to have an advantage. Chemicals, speaking of black markets, chemicals are kind of interesting because it's, they actually form kind of what's called a, a gray market where stuff is not explicitly prohibited or you can get it internationally sometimes, but it's, pro, it's, um, illegal in certain countries, but not other countries. And the way that the internet has worked mm -hmm. and the, the nature of chemicals in general and drugs in general um, means that you can, sometimes you can, you know, right over the internet, you can order things that, that should be banned that are, you know, potentially more dangerous than stuff that's already banned. Um, but it's not illegal yet because all it takes is, you know, changing a bromine to a fluorine and you get a drug with almost identical properties, but it's not the same drug. So it's not illegal technically yet. Um, and so you wind up with a lot of, uh, oh, that's, if you've ever, the term was really big when I was in high school, designer drugs. A lot of times that's what those are. Is you take, take cocaine and you replace one element or one atom with a different element. And all of a sudden it's not cocaine, but it's something that'll still get you high. 
Um, and so there, that's what that term designer drugs or some, I think now they're called research chemicals um, to make it seem like you're not doing anything sketchy. You're just ordering research chemicals. Um, but it's a lot of a lot of stuff. Like that's what bath salts are effectively. Um, and, you, and I'm sure everybody's heard the, the horror stories of you know Floridians on bath salts <laughs> eating their neighbors and things like that. Does um, <laughs> seem to be in Florida a lot. All right, how do new projections apply to cyclostructures? We're going to do some of that today. But basically, they're just a convenient way of showing some of these steric interactions, and so that you can see um, more obviously, or you can demonstrate, oh, what well, this type of interaction is going to happen, which is going to be unfavorable or favorable. So they're they're convenient, basically, just as a way of emphasizing certain types of steric interactions, um, and we will see some uh, examples in a couple minutes. Um, and do resonance structures apply? Well, I mean, the, all the resonance stuff still applies with, with Newman structures, but usually we're talking about different things. With resonance structures, we're talking about where the electrons are and where the pylons are typically. And with Newman projections, usually we're talking about where the nuclei and the sigma bonds are because we're using it to discuss, um, we're using it to discuss, you know, Eclipsed versus staggered conformers. We don't see that as much with aromatics or with resonance structures because they tend to be planar. I think we ended Thursday talking about, you know, what would it look like if we threw ethene um, as in a Newman structure? And like, well, I guess we, you know, you could show where the pi bonds were really clearly that way. But in general, it's a planar molecule. So we don't need to worry about showing it, showing a planar molecule end on. We don't, there's not usually that much interesting happening, and it's a lot more work to visualize it and draw it that way compared to just drawing it flat. Um, but then, but in that, you know, I kind of, I think I kind of answered the second part here. Why do we show so many different variations of the same thing? Because sometimes we're talking about different parts of the molecule, we're talking about sterics versus talking about resonance versus talking about ions. Um, you're going to want to emphasize different parts of the molecule. So it's helpful to be able to draw it facing different directions and just to be able to visualize it in 3D. You know, ideally, if we you know, had a holographic projector or something right here, instead of having, instead of having to do all these various ways of doing that, we would just have a 3D representation of the molecule floating here and I could pick, pick it up and move it and show you whatever I wanted to show you and we could do it that way. But since we're still limited by binder paper and flat screens for the most part, we have to get creative with how we show these three D molecules. Larry Green kept going on about what he was trying to um, augmented reality and uh, you know using using stuff like that for um, for uh, educational purposes. It would be really cool if we get to the point where we have holographic projections that will totally change the way we teach chemistry especially OCHEM and orbitals and stuff, to be able to just view it in 3D instead of having to use your imagination would um, be a totally different thing, but we're just not there yet. In bio, they have fun live labs where... Yeah, and we, we've done some too. We got... Yeah, it's still clunky. And... It's still clunky, and we did some of them in Gen Chem. Um, if you remember doing the Vesper lab in yeah. Gen Chem, where I had you go on and like click to add a bond and see what that does to move everything around. Um, but you're still looking at a 2D screen, and some people still have trouble visualizing three dimensions from a 2D screen, even if you can click and drag around, it's still a learned skill. So being able to actually put it up in 3D, even if it's just you know, a, a you know, hologram of it, um, would be really, really helpful, especially if everybody had a desk that they were sitting at that was capable of doing their own holograms. Um, is it uh, Ender's Game? An Ender's Game, the um, old sci-fi book from the from the eighties. Um, they all have their uh, the kids have a desk, which is like a tablet, but it, it's a tablet that projects in three D in front of them. Um, you know, so they were thinking about this all the way back in the eighties, um, and we'll get there eventually. We're not far from it. It's just still really expensive right now. <laughs> Um, Google Glasses, that's what, so augmented reality is one way to get around that. If everybody has Google Glasses or something similar on, 
they can project a three-dimensional shape in front of you, in front of your eye, rather than um, rather than having to to do it on a screen. Um, your brain just processes that differently. In in the, um, what's the other term? The VR. VR. There's done some really interesting studies about VR and how your brain processes it not as watching something, but actually as participating in it, um, which is really scary as a as a Parent and they were with video games and stuff like that. Like I hate to be the one I love video games, but apparently there's actually some neuro, um, some neuroscience research um, suggesting that you have to be very very careful with VR because your brain interprets it as actual experience. So playing a you know a shooter, you can give yourself PTSD and and things like that, and um, which is really good for things like therapy. They've done a lot of studies with like aversion therapy where like, somebody who's afraid of the heights, they have them put on a VR headset and then walk to the edge of the Empire State Building and look down and their body processes it as though they were actually there. Um, so there's some interesting therapeutic techniques and some educational techniques, um, but also potentially it could be really, really, we have no idea what that's gonna do to people's, to kids' brains 50 years from now. Um, if they spend a whole bunch of time in VR doing that right now, shooting things. I never thought I would be the, oh, video games. <laughs> video games are going to ruin our kids. Um, anyway. And then the last question, this goes back. I said something on Thursday. I said the torsion strain is different than steric strain. Not exactly true. So that's a good catch. Um, it's a subset of steric strain. You can have angular steric strain where they're just pushing each other outward. And then, but if you don't allow it to freely rotate, the rotation is what makes it torsional strain. The fact that it's pushing it, it's rotating on that dihedral angle. That's why we call it torsional strain. Um, but if you have something that's locked in place, that's not a, like a ring structure where it's not allowed to freely rotate, then that creates more what we would consider an angle strain. Um, they're all kind of related and they're all caused by the same thing. They're all caused by sterics. It's just a different way of, of a different not application um, outcome, a different outcome. If it's allowed to rotate, you get that torsion force versus just tweaking things. The torsion is like specific to this uh, sigma bonds that can rotate. Exactly. You have the exactly. That are rotating for well, just creating a force that goes like this versus creating a force that goes like this. Yeah, you can consider this would be a bend, and this would be a twist. Um, and when we get into IR, they, they absorb light differently. It's a different, they have a different energy associated with those vibrations. Twists versus bends versus stretches are all gonna be caused partly by sterics or entirely by sterics, but they're gonna have a different net result. You can think about it that way. So it would be like a torsion bar versus a strut versus the airbag suspension. Because torsion bars have that twisting force to keep you up. The stretching from the airbags is what is the force maybe you, know? I, you think more of it like just traditional um, shocks. Shocks. Uh, so typically a stretch, we usually think of that. We can represent that as just being a spring between the two nuclei. Gotcha. So more just like a traditional suspension. Versus, um, if you if you do have some suspension that allows for that twisting, yeah, um, it might just be reusing the same term though, torsional versus because I guess we're talking about two different things, right? Torsional suspension is talking about the whole frame sort of rotating versus just one wheel moving up and down, right? I think it's the I have torsion bars in my truck, which uh -huh. are big bars that can move back frame and twist up, and you can adjust the twisting motion to lift up the truck or put it down. So those, it's similar. Yeah. Yes, it's similar. We're going to use the terms a little bit differently in, because when we're talking about the molecule bending and stretching, right. twisting, um, but it's going to be pretty similar um, logic. Yeah. <laughs> um, how'd the quiz go? Anybody have any trouble? Just like I said, I didn't give final grades, but it looked like the first few, everybody did, did pretty well. Um, the autocorrect and stuff anyway. Uh, the top one's pretty pretty easy to see. You've got two methyl groups attached to carbon three versus two methyl groups attached to carbon two. Makes it nicer. 
and here in this bottom one. <clears throat> and if we can find the same longest continuous carbon chain, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and this is seven as well. We've got methyl and carbon two and methyl and carbon four. So that looks the same. And then ethyl on carbon three. So same molecule, different complement. Just drawn differently or twisted around differently. And that's generally speaking, that's going to be the my go-to technique for figuring this out is basically go through the process like you're going to name it. And if you wind up with the same name twice following our standard rules, then it's it's going to be a conformer. It's the same molecule. Um, any issues with the naming? Not after grid. Not after you saw the answers, right? <laughs> um, yeah, just make sure you're keeping your numbers as low as possible, ideally. Um, but for the most part, I think everybody's got a handle on that, so I'm not going to spend. Um, too much time on that. Was this one tricky at all? I mean, no more than any of the other Newman projection ones, right? Just yeah. the first, but once you get the hang of it. Yeah. You're going to have a chlorine up into the right and a bromine up into the left and a methyl group down on the front carbon. On the back carbon, it's going to be a chlorine down into the right and a bromine down into the left and a methyl group straight up. And it just had you draw it, right? Or did it have you also identify the lowest energy? Okay, I think it's just had you draw it. Yeah. There, um, was, then for, just, there was an identifying uh, as the lowest energy levels. There wasn't one of those, right? There was one. Oh, there was one. Okay. No. Okay. Um, but then just for the sake of drawing this, you'll notice that. It doesn't really matter for the front carbon if we draw that draw it as a as a Y shape versus drawing it the other way around. It doesn't really matter, right? Draw it how it's convenient, how it's drawn over here. You're not stuck having to, you know, it doesn't need to be as a Y shape versus a inverted Y. Um, which of these is going to be the biggest group sterically? Chlorine is, a, is higher than bromine on the periodic table, so bromine's bigger. So our lowest energy complement would be having the bromines opposite from each other. There's probably a, a way that, um, there's probably an example where, you, where your lowest energy complement is not with the biggest group opposite. For instance, if they're, um, if doing that created two other less favorable interactions, they're Neither one of them is quite as big as the as the other one, but they're almost as big. But we only have three choices for where to put things, right? Um, so in pretty much, you know, you guys know I struggle with with um, absolutes, but I think I can't think of anything off the top of my head where where it's going to be anything other than put the two biggest things on opposite sides from each other. Question would be, um, what if there's two, two like two bromines instead of chlorine on the exact side? Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's a good point. So if you had two of them, then no matter what, one of the bromines has to be eclipsed, and the other bromine is going to be gauche. Or, or sorry, one of the bromines is going to be anti, and the other one's going to be gauche. Which so then it's a matter of what is that third group, and how do we minimize interactions between that third group. And, and whatever's on the other part, right? So it's it's kind of nice. You only have three options. So worst case scenario, draw all three of them and look, pick one that looks best, right? Anything that you can you can look at it and turn it into a multiple choice question is always a good thing when it comes to finding an answer, right? Because you just eliminate the ones you know it can't be. And you're you're making progress. All right. 
Um, so I touched on this at the end of class. We talked about strain energy. Um, and strain energy is, it has its own specific term, mostly because it's stuck there. So a lot of the torsional strain that we've been talking about, the rotational strain in sterics, if you're freely allowed to rotate, it's not really trapped energy. Um, but a molecule that has these sigma bonds that are in this, where the sigma bond is forcing things to be closer than they want to be, then that kind of is its, is its own thing because that molecule can, keeps that energy contained within it until you're allowed to actually break those bonds. So it's a little bit different than just rotational energy and rotational sterics. Um, which, but it also means you can make molecules that are really, really unstable, that have a ton of strain energy that will release it all at once sometimes. Um, for instance, my, my OCHEM professor did some work in the, I would say it was the late 80s at the time, um, that he was doing his, his research for the Defense Department on uh, novel explosives. Um, what molecules could we make that might be better explosives? Um, and he and his, his research group created a molecule that they call botidine. <laughs> um, and, but you can see how that's going to be really, really unstable, right? But it's kind of all of that energy. It's like if you, if you can picture maybe like one of those um, open the can of chips and the, and the snake spring the snake pops out of you. You're trapping all that energy in there until something happens to release it all at once. Um, and that's that's the difference between the strain energy versus, you know, if you just have a spring just vibrating back and forth, that's a little bit more just like regular rotational energy. It's happening all the time. There's a more stressed and less stressed state, but it's kind of just free to move about however it wants. Um, turns out this molecule, if you give it just a little bit of a nudge of energy, it releases a ton of strain energy and turns into cyclohexane um, really, really easily um, because it's got everything kind of stuck in that strain structure. Um, so it didn't wind up working as an explosive because you want, you want explosives that are really, really stable until you want them to explode, right? Um, especially in a military application, you really don't want something that may explode if it gets to 85 degrees. Um, that's less than ideal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the release of energy would just come from the pi and the sigma bond, and then it would just form that cycle. Of you wind up basically, it winds up rearranging itself. Basically, you wind up breaking, um, breaking some pi bonds and then reforming. You get a bunch of other side products along with it, but for the most part, the dominant project product is just going to be it, it rearranging itself as cyclohexane. Rather, if you look at the formula, it won't be strictly cyclohexane. I think it winds up being cyclohexadiene, um, where it's got two pi bonds and one ring structure instead of one pi bond and two ring structures. Gotcha. So the energy release is just that strain energy. That's it's just that strain energy. energy. Right. You, you wind up reforming pretty much all the same bonds you started with, but that extra strain energy has to go somewhere. So it's released as heat. Um, I would make it would could potentially make a really good rocket fuel um, or something like that where you could keep it in a controlled situation where you needed to generate heat without generating a whole bunch of extra molecules. Burning things generally produces a whole bunch of extra molecules and in rocket science. There's sometimes when you want that as a propellant, it's sometimes where you want to be able to generate heat without um, generating a whole bunch of extra CO2 or oxygen molecules or anything like that. Anyway, um, looking at these geometries, which ring structure would we expect to be the most stable in, in terms of strain energy? Which one's going to have the least strain energy? Yeah, we would be closest to 109. Even closest to 109, they're all tetrahedral, right? So we would think the cyclopentane. Um, the thing is, is that we're, we're representing this as being two-dimensional when really we do have three dimensions to work in. So basically, once you get to cyclopentene, anything above that is fine for the most part. 
because once you get past that, yeah, that's 120 degrees and it wants to be 109, but you have three dimensions to work in. And so it'll basically tweak itself out of being planar in order to get those bonds 109 degrees from each other or close to it. And so we're going to spend most of today's lecture talking about cyclohexane because it does some interesting things in 3D. We see some interesting interactions. Um, so it's, it's sort of a case study. It's the, the way we first learn about sterics and how in three dimensions. So we start with new human projections on simple things. And then we say, what if it's a ring structure? Look at this weirdness that happens. Um, but cyclobutanes and cyclopropanes are both really, really unstable because they have a ton of ring energy. And so and we can measure it. If we look at heat of combustion per carbon, so we're going to normalize by the number of carbons um, because every carbon gets turned all the way to CO2 if it's a combustion reaction, right? So if we normalize per carbon, cyclopropane has almost 700 kilojoules per mole heat of combustion compared to, and this scale is a little bit deceptive, we've zoomed in, um, cyclobutane, 680, cyclo, uh, pentane, thank you, is just under 660. So you can see that difference right there, that's all strain energy. And, but what we do see is because five carbons is 108, so it's still a little closer than they want to be. Um, and it still does, if we force these things to all be perfectly planar, it does create some eclipsed configurations, right? Because those hydrogens are still going to have unfavorable interactions with other hydrogens. And so we actually see that the lowest energy is cyclohexane because it has just enough freedom to rotate to move stuff out of the way that you can get almost everything to a perfect tetrahedral or close to it while minimizing um, eclipsed interactions. And so here's should we look this one? So if it's cyclopropane, if we drop Newman structure, the tricky part of this Newman structure is it's not free to rotate, right? So effectively, you're stuck with this carbon carbon bond and this carbon carbon bond almost have to be eclipsed because it's a triangle, right? So by definition, they three carbons have to be in plane with each other, right? If three carbons are, have to be in a plane with each other. That means that these hydrogens are going to wind up being eclipsed with each other as well. So we're stuck in that eclipsed configuration. And I think that I threw this up um, the other day as a way to, to look at how we have less over, overlap between the bonds as well. Basically, in, a, in, a, in order to try and keep these electron clouds as far away from each other as possible, as close to 109 as possible, they wind up sort of tweaking the bond so that they're holding on, but barely. Um, trying to think of a good analogy. The, if you have like a Velcro strap holding something together, you need it to be a longer Velcro strap. You go like that, right? So that just a little bit of the Velcro is overlapping. It's not as strong as a way to attach things though, right? Um, so, and we actually call these, because these bonds don't look like real um, sigma bonds, normal sigma bonds anymore, they actually call these banana bonds because they're vaguely banana shaped. Um, but that just, that is part of what accounts for some of that, um, that strain energy. Part of the strain energy is the fact that the bonds aren't as strong as they should be. And part of it is that we have this um, torsional strain by forcing these hydrogens to be eclipsed, even though they don't normally want to be. Um, we see that a little bit, a fair bit less in cyclobutane. But what we'll see is basically that torsional strain kind of forces it to not be a true, a true square. It's not a two-dimensional shape. If it was a two-dimensional square, then everything would be perfectly 90 degrees, right? And then you would have all your hydrogens over here. 
But if we looked at that from a Newman projection, we'd have the same issue. If it was perfectly straight or perfectly flat, then we're locking our hydrogens into being these eclipse configuration. Bending it a little bit. Yeah, it's not ideal because we force these bonds closer together than 90 degrees or 88 degrees rather than 90 degrees. But that's still better because it allows these hydrogens to not be totally eclipsed and allows these carbons not be totally eclipsed. We look at the Newman projection here. Let's just say we were looking down that bond. Let's see if I can do this. We're going to have a hydrogen straight down, up and up and to the right is another hydrogen. And then up and to the left is going to be our carbon. And then on the back carbon, that allows us to have this carbon be sort of not all the way down and left, but those are the ones that are then connected to each other. Right, and so then that on the back carbon, then we were able to have hydrogen be a little bit less eclipsed. It gets really tricky to visualize to turn this to that, right? It's, this is a, a step above from what we've, we've been doing. Um, and then you're gonna have a sip, but every single carbon carbon bond is gonna have a similar Newman projection. They're all gonna be more or less identical. But that's why that puckered shape kind of exists. Yes, it makes these bonds 88 instead of 90, but it means these hydrogens don't have to be perfectly eclipsed. So it's a balance. You're balancing the torsional strain energy versus the bonding strain energy to try and minimize both of them. Um, and they refer to that as being a puckered shape. Um, I don't quite know where where that comes from, <laughs> it both would work as well. It's basically it's picture taking a square and pulling one corner of the square up a little bit. Keep three of the corners of the square in a flat and you just pull up one corner of the square. And so you, you could picture that being <laughs> just a piece of paper, right? You're trying to, to identify what that shape looks like. Is it like kind of like a saddle sort of? Or? It also winds up if you change your frame of reference, yeah, it does wind up a little bit of like a saddle. You have these two carbons are up above, and these two carbons, the front and back carbons down. So you wind up with something where, like this, where every you know my pointer and my thumb are each a carbon. Um, I find it a little bit easier to picture it as carbon, 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 and then up. You picture these three being flat on a surface and then the fourth one out because three points will always define a plane right by mathematical definitions and pick any three points it's a plane so if you picture these three as being flat this one is just tilted upward gotcha. i was thinking like rain fly for hands yeah a rain fly for hands. same thing so that's a, a saddle shape as well right um, two points up and two points down. So cyclopentane, you see how these start getting a lot more complicated as we start adding more carbons. Three carbons, it has to be flat because it's only three points, right? Four carbons, we can allow it to dimple, pucker a little bit. We see the same thing really though with um, with five carbons, one of the four of them more or less in the same plane, and then a fifth one kind of popped up. Um, turns out that all four of these are not. It's really like if you picture these three as being flat, this one's popped up and this one's popped down. Because that allows us to minimize those eclipsed interactions a little bit more. Um, which is part of the reason cyclopentane is more stable than cyclobutane is because it's, we have one more degree of freedom to avoid having everything be eclipsed. Um, and so, and 
this one, now we're getting to the point where, where drawing a human projection might be helpful to illustrate some things, but not to see that the shape of it overall, because now we, we drew a Newman projection looking down this bond. Now we have three carbons attached to each other off the side. So yeah, we could, we could show that they're not eclipsed by doing that. But then what's really interesting about this molecule is the overall shape of the carbons, not looking at any one individual carbon carbon bond. Um, so the Newman projection is mainly useful for looking at the the uh, torsional strain. Exactly. Of exactly. Of a single bond, specific or single bond. We, so we will see that. And actually, when we get to cyclo, cyclohexane, we can actually draw it as two Newman projections next to each other, connected at the front and the back. Because you have two carbons here, two carbons here, carbon there, carbon here. We'll end up being able to make a hexagon that way, and then it becomes useful again because now we can actually see the overall shape. But because of because of nature having five carbons here, we can't look. These aren't parallel. We could kind of show it with two Newman's Newman projections, but they're not going to be parallel to each other, right? So it's not. Let's try it. <laughs> let's see what it looks like. We can make something look. Um, so let's say there's our carbon that connects the two. And then on the back carbons, the back carbons have to be connected to each other. Right? And so then if we draw 120 degrees from there, this is, the, 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 this is the cycle of pentane. So remember, each of these Newman projections is two carbons, right? Like we're looking down a carbon carbon bond. So our fifth carbon is connecting the two Newman projections. Uh, and then that means if those are connected to each other, really it's not like they're parallel, it's more like they're pointed towards each other a little bit to get that overall shape. And but then to get 120 degrees from each of those others, you wind up with something that's still a little bit strained because you're forcing those hydrogens to be a little bit closer together than they want to be. And actually, this one can go over here. This one can be up here. If you forced it into like a 2D plane, um, the hydrogens would move closer together. And if you forced it to be in a 2D plane, then that would make those those hydrogens more eclipsed. It's like so right, exactly. Yeah, you can pick if you can picture moving this up, these hydrogens then are going to rotate so that they're 120 degrees ish from this middle carbon, right? Which means you're going to force them to be on top in that eclipse shape. So we really only see that when we when we have no other options, basically, which is when they're when it's aromatic, because then everything must be sp3 or sp2 rather. So if it's aromatic, even with only five members in the ring, um, that's okay because instead of having two eclipse structure or two eclipse interactions, you only have one because you only have three things attached to each carbon, and they're 120 degrees instead of 109, and so that eclipse strain energy is less important. And that allows you to have more pi pi interactions instead. All right. And then the cyclohexane would just be like placing that blue line is with instead of the blue line, you get another carbon carbon back there. So that gives you a lot more ability to rotate things around, right? And get it so that those angles are even further apart. So there is a there is one Newman projection in the rest of the molecule. So if we look down that line, there you see that they're they're not 60 full degrees from each other. So there's still some of that interaction where they're kind of forced to be there. But by popping that that front carbon up and that back carbon down, that allows you to, to minimize that a little bit. And so if we were defining a plane. 
Yeah, is that that might make more sense if you say that the plane that we're defining is these two carbons in this one. No, then you get the carbon in front sticking up above the plane and the carbon in back down below the plane. Lets you lets you move stuff around a little bit more. But yeah, it's just it, yes, it winds up being sort of weird. And, and if, again, if you use your imagination and kind of think spatially, think about what this structure is trying to show you. It's more or less flat with the end point that's pointed towards you, sticking up a little bit. You take that and just rotate it so that you're looking down that bond. Yeah, pretty easy to see with a little bit of practice that that's the same shape, just drawn a little slightly differently to emphasize those those um, axial interactions. So when you drew the two Newman projections that just blocked down that other side so you couldn't really show the up and down. Right, and I, you couldn't really show the up and down and you couldn't really show, and it, it wasn't strictly accurate because when you draw the two Newman projections, it makes it look like this bond and this bond were parallel to each other yeah. and they're not. But I wasn't gonna try and freehand that other one. All right, so let's talk about cyclohexane because now we do have the ability to make those two opposite sides parallel to each other, at least pretty close to. Uh, and so we can see what that looks like. Basically, cyclohexane is the most stable of these ring structures because it has just enough um, degrees of freedom that it can make pretty much everything into a um, staggered conformation and still be close to 109 right because if it was a flat structure um think about taking this one they call the boat boat one if you picture rotating these end carbons downward so that it was flat you can say okay well that i, I see where it's a hexagon now and, and it would normally be you forced it to be flat, they'd be 120 degrees from each other, which is too far now. So in this case, allowing it to rotate up out of the plane allows those two bonds to be closer to each other rather than further from each other. Um, and that brings it to 109-ish and also gives you the ability to minimize these um, eclipse interactions. All right, so just, just looking at it as it's drawn here, which of these would we expect to be more stable? Don't overthink it. Why? Is that not so I, don't know. I still, I still want to know <laughs> some logic. <laughs> You're right. It's the chair. Hydrogens oh, <laughs> just are more staggered. So the hydrogens more, and even even ignoring the hydrogens, these carbons are just further apart from each other, right? And it looks like that name is just kind of. Yeah, and if you do wind up, we'll see it more when we get to things other than hydrogen is attached here. But I'm overemphasizing the bonds now. But if you, these hydrogens are sort of pointed towards each other, if you put it into a chair conformation, right? So we're actually creating like axial, or not axial, we're, we're kind of creating um, steric torsion where we don't need there to be. But from carbons on opposite ends of the ring, instead of being carbons that are directly next to each other by forcing these hydrogens to point towards each other. So versus the chair gets kind of everything pointed further away from each other. It's gonna get, allow us to get the bond angles a little bit better too. But even just, just looking, just from this angle, even remember we're drawing these as being straight lines, but really, if this is a tetrahedral shape, tetrahedral means that you've got one bond going away from you from the point of view of this front carbon, that would be a dashed bond, right? 
which means this one would be kind of pointed out towards us. And same on this side, this one would be going back towards it. This hydrogen would be pointing out towards us. And then if this bond is flat in the board and this, these bonds are flat in the board, we're kind of locking it into being eclipsed confirmation if we do that, right? Versus if we're in the chair confirmation, that allows us to everything sort of rotate a little bit more and not be locked into that chair confirmation because now the one that's going back is pointed down versus back and pointed up. So that's that 60 degree shift instead of being eclipsed. So if you took one side of the boat, instead of both carbons pointing up from the plane, if one switches and points down, does that make it a chair? Exactly. All you do is switch back and forth between these, take this carbon, instead of rotating it down to be flat, like I had us do mentally to begin with, you rotate it further, you get the chair confirmed. That's it kind of is constantly flipping back and forth between chair and boat confirmer. Um, when we're at room temperature, as we get, as we cool it down, we can kind of limit that and lock it into place. Um, and we're going to start seeing that when we have stuff other than hydrogen attached, we get the same type of steric interactions um, that we saw with, with bromines and chlorines, and methyl groups with the, the simpler Newman projections, right? All right, so here's your Newman projection. For cyclohexene, and you're looking down both of those bonds simultaneously, you get something that looks like this. And really, if I was this is the chair confirmation. Is there any way to drop both as a new projection? It would just be with this one up, so it'd be kind of on top of that back one. And so taking this structure and just rotating it so that the point of the chair, the footrest of the chair is pointed towards us. That's this carbon. And the headrest of the chair is that one in the back. And so you can see how if you rotated both of these so that you had the, the bow confirmation, that would mean taking these rotate up about 60 degrees, right? And you wind up, these also need to ro rotate 60 degrees then. So we'd, we'd be locking, yeah, we'd be locking it into an eclipse configuration. This is just another way of viewing the same thing we just, that we talked about in the last one. Um, yeah, the chair bomber is the most stable because um, we're able to only have I don't, I don't want to say locking into because these are constantly flipping back and forth. Um, but we are able to have um, less uh, eclipse confirmation. The other thing, maybe this is, I'm going to say this and I'm going to take a break and I'm not going to talk about it again because I don't want to confuse you. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it again yet. What we call, what I call the headrest and the footrest. Are kind of chosen by convenience. It turns out um, every single carbon is identical in this. It's symmetric. So, so if you use your imagination, this is the headrest and that's the footrest. It's just pointed out towards you, right? Or this is the headrest and that's the footrest. Right? If you think about it from a, it says chair, but I'm picturing like lazy boy chair with the footrest, right? Um, or a, a cool, cool side chair, potentially. Um, so they're all identical for the most part when it's in the chair confirmation and when it's in the boat confirmation. It's drawn so that you have, you know, four that are flat, one up and one up. But you could, if you shifted your, your point of view, and this one's a little bit harder to visualize. Um, but you can make this carbon and this carbon the points of the boat. And these ones being the ones that are more or less parallel to each other. They're not, they're not drawn that way. That's a lot harder to visualize. 
but all it's this it's a very similar situation unless we have another substituent other than hydrogen attached somewhere all of the carbons are pretty much identical it's just really hard to see with the boat structure right so for the most part we're going to we're we're going to draw it in a way that is um convenient to us the other thing it's one of those once you see it, you're going to never be able to unsee it. Is let's see if I can. <laughs> the Budweiser logo. I'm not sure if they're still using this one. Um, basically, is that same exact shape. You just erase the hydrogens. And write Budweiser across it, you get the Budweiser logo. <laughs> um, and I have no idea. I think it's supposed to look like a bow tie. That's why Budweiser went with it. Um, but I can't look at it without seeing cyclohexan. So anyway, let's take a break. Let's come back at 10 after, and we're going to get some practice wrong on these. <laughs> so you finished it. You finished the last. <laughs> 
Also, I'll just I'll point out as well that um, I'm using a lot of figures from from the textbook that we used in the class last year, um, but they're very similar figures in in um, the OpenStax book. This, this looks really similar to what we were just talking about, right? Um, and it's all in the same order, more or less. So, for if you look at chapter three, chapter three is all 
uh, it's all about Newman projections and um, how to how to draw them and showing those front carbons and back carbons. So just like we were we we're looking at a lot of the same figures, right? Um, so if you want other, you know, slightly different figures, or even that one, the numbers are even the same. You can see that almost like this has been a topic that's been taught really, really consistently for like the last 70, 80, 90 years. Um, we just have better figures now than they used to. Um, but when it gets to, I it reminded me of this because I was looking ahead in the slides and said from page whatever of Klein, Klein is the textbook from last year. Um, so I'm looking at It's even better figures. Nice work. <laughs> Here's the process for drawing cyclo cyclohexanes as a as a ring structure, and that's on page one fourteen of of uh, the McMurray book. So change that real quick. Pretty similar, it's the same process. So, all right. Um, the next slide was just same thing we kind of talked about already. Um, just those those interactions that aren't um, torsional interactions, but they're from opposite ends. They're still sterics. There's still things pushing on each other. Um, but the term that's used is flagpole interactions. I um, mean, picture those hydrogens as being flagpoles. They're sort of pointed towards each other. And you think of them kind of like pushing against each other. Um, it's not the best way of visualizing things, but that's the term that's used. So we'll go with it. But same thing we were just we were just talking about. If you look at here's our new our dual Newman projection of the chair conformer. And here's it drawn facing towards us horizontally so that you can emphasize these interactions. And wanted to draw the hydrogens that's from this front carbon versus. Ah, Hesitated too long. There. That's on the back carbon. It's coming out towards us. You know, the front carbon is going back towards the middle, right? So that's that flagpole interaction. You can see why they don't bother showing that normally, because from this angle, it's really hard to make that make any sense on a 2D shape. Um, the other the other resource that I will point you towards for being able to see these in 3D is one, you can build your own. We have model kits um, and I'll get them out so that, so that everybody can um, build structure. You can check out a model kit or you can, they're like, I think they're under 20 bucks on Amazon for your own um, to be able to build these. But there's also, this is a resource that we use a lot in GenChem for crystal structures. Um, Chem2 3D is run by a university, University of Nottingham, I think. Um, someplace in UK, um, but they have, you go under organic, they have, they have a whole thing on, oh, they added a lot on here. We're just going to use the search bar. Cyclohexane conformers. Wanted to draw them so that you could or see it in 3D. So there's a chair conformer. You can click and drag around. And it rotates for you. 
versus one that shows the, the actual process is two. Um, and the, the chair conformer is not as much um, every carbon is the same. The bow conformer, if you click around and drag down 3D, you can make any carbon you want be the headrest or the foot rest. That, that's a, a little bit harder to do. It's pretty easy to see with the bow conformer. Like you've got four that are pretty much flat that are in plane and then one up and one up on opposite sides. It's kind of hard to, to go the other way and make any other four of them um, work like that. Um, so I was I was off on that. I thought that you could do that, but that's just with this with the boat comp or with the um, chair comp, you can do that. Bring where the uh, animations. All right, well, I'll have to find the one that actually lets you walk through the potential energy surface that we're going to see next. Um, but basically, that those flagpole interactions in particular, and the fact that everything is stuck eclipsed, um, mean that this isn't truly a conformer in the sense of it's, it's stable, um, because it's still kind of sitting as a potential energy maximum. It's still sitting as a transition state, basically. Because all it would take to throw things off, if you picture these, and I, I get redraw ones that I don't like drawing, sticking straight up towards each other. You can picture those pointed towards each other. All it takes to get things a little bit lower in energy, so my elbows are the, the points, the carbons are the points, my hands are the hydrogens. If you just do that, now all of a sudden they're not pointed directly towards each other. That tweaks everything just enough that you can have them not be perfectly eclipsed. So what we actually see is that the boat conformer is actually a transition state because you have those things and a flat pointed right towards each other. If you twist it just a little bit, you get what they call the twist boat. We're not going to bother drawing the twist boat as a different conformer usually. Um, but it's not perfectly flat like like the boat structure with these carbons perfectly in line with each other. These two carbons and these two hydrogens wind up sort of shifting just a little bit. Um, while still showing the same overall shape. And that's what we call that twist boat. If I can, yeah, I don't really have a good way of if three fingers, the back three carbons and the front three carbons. That's the full boat where my, my pointers are directly aligned with each other. Twist boat looks kind of like that. One of the four that were flat with each other, one goes up and one goes down on each side versus that sort of switch back and forth between that. The boat is when everything is perfectly aligned and symmetrical and pretty and easy to draw. The twist boat is how it actually behaves. Um, and really, what's most important is being able to draw the chair conformers, because most of the time these things are going to spend their time in the chair uh, conformers, because those are so much more stable. If you look at the difference in energy, it's 23 kilojoules per mole. Um, and if you remember the equation for equilibrium constants, equilibrium constant was equal to e to the negative delta G over RT, right? Well, if you use 8.314 for R, and use room temperature in Kelvin for T, and we can assume that even though delta G, usually delta H minus T delta S, we didn't change the number of molecules or anything really, right? So there's really no change in entropy between these two. So we can basically say that that's gonna be pretty close to zero. If we plug in 23 kilojoules per mole here to 2300 or 23,000, we wind up with what do we want to get for K? So E to the negative 23 times 10 to the third over 8.314. 
times 298. 23,000 puts, and then you get 300 times eight, it's gonna be 2,400-ish, right? So we're gonna get e to the negative 10, roughly, which should come out to, I don't know, 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus six or so? Oh, 10 to the minus five. 10 to the minus five, I'm calling that pretty close. Yeah, pretty close. Exponential close. in my head. <laughs> um, so that means that, so if equilibrium constant is 10 to the minus five, that means for every 10,000 molecules, 9,999 9, 9, of them are going to be found in the chair, and one will be found in the boat conformer, in the twist boat conformer. Right, so at equilibrium, at room temperature, we overwhelmingly are going to favor being in the chair conformer. Pretty impressive stuff. It's what is, and it's, it really, really drives home the difference. That's not even that small of an equilibrium constant, right? The effect of, of temperature in these, these calculated energies um, winds up being really pretty significant because of that exponential term. Um, like I, I've brought up many times, the, doing computational chemistry, we kind of had a rule of thumb for a, whether a reaction will happen in a reasonable amount of time. It's somewhat arbitrary, but it was about 20 kcals per mole which winds up being you know, 80 to 100 kilojoules per mole as, a, as an activation energy is something you could say that the reaction will happen at room temperature. So having 23 kilojoules per mole as your reaction energy with a 45 kilojoule per mole barrier means that it's gonna be at equilibrium at room temperature, which means you're gonna favor those chair conformers pretty strongly. Would anything stand for uh, narrow out the wavelength of this as far as changing of the numbers. Well, when you talk about from the left to right, talk about the x axis, this graph is somewhat arbitrary. It's just chosen so that it can you can see things, but it can still fit on a page of paper. So this isn't um, relativity to time. It's just no, exactly, exactly. Um, the y axis, the energy is to scale. Or should be in the in these graphs, normally speaking. Um, but yeah, the reaction progress is however you need to define it to show what you want to show. So the other thing I'll point out here is that when it goes from the chair to the boat, it kind of goes. Um, it can go through this intermediate they call the half chair which is where you, know, you flip the footrest up but the headrest is still where it was and so you get this halfway point where it's kind of in between where if you think about balancing something on top balancing a marble on top of a, a hill it could roll either direction from it right this is a transition state where either way it goes it's going to become more stable just like the, the boat, when you had those bipolar interactions pointed right towards each other, it was at a trans transition state. Um, but it, so it kind of goes in two steps. You flip up um, the footrest and all the way up to get to that twist bow. But then you can actually keep going and take what was the headrest and flip that down so that you still wind up with a chair, but you wind up with your carbon sort of in opposite directions from where they were. And that's going to become important in a minute when we start putting a substituent on one of these. Um, here's just the practice for drawing these. To, let's take a second just so we can all halfway draw a chair conformer. Everybody's getting good at drawing regular hexagons and pentagons, right? But let's try this one. Um, this is the way this structure or this textbook explained it. And I'll show you another one as well. Once you've drawn it this way, you can decide which way you like better.
the trick with this is to try and draw it as much as you can with the opposite sides of your hexagon of your chair conformer still being parallel as much as possible. Um, if you can do that, then whatever, however you draw it, it's going to be pretty close to a chair conformer. Um, they obviously can't all be perfectly parallel to each other, or you can't wind up drawing um, everything connected properly. But the way that I have always drawn it is start with the two armrests. You just draw two parallel arm uh, lines that are offset just a little bit. It should be roughly the same length, but if you're going to make one a little bit longer, make the bottom one because that's going to be the carbon that's pointed out towards us. And then you just wind up connecting the two armrests by drawing by drawing a quick upside down V and a V. So that's the same thing, you just sort of rotate it so that the, they're horizontal. But yeah, you can offset that if you don't want them horizontal. I've always found it easier to start with those parallel arm breasts and then just connect them with a V. Um, sometimes wind up with structures that don't look quite as good, but everybody knows here that we're dealing with chair conformers, then that's usually close enough. Um, and that also means it's pretty easy to draw a boat conformer as well, right? You just make them, you don't offset them as much. You draw a boat conformer, draw two parallel lines, the bottom one centered and the top one and a little bit bigger. And connect them in the same way. Um, however you do it, again, just as long as you make it close enough, the people that know what they're looking at can generally see what you're doing. It doesn't have to be perfect every time. I don't get all paranoid about drawing a hexagon every time I draw a benzene ring, right? I don't make my hexagon perfect. I just need to make it close enough that everybody can see what I'm trying to draw. Just like a letter for that matter. Your, your letter A doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be good enough that it's legible. All right, so here's where it gets Formatting's a little bit off here. Um, where we're going to bring in some of these other concepts. Um, is we have to remember that these carbons that are in this boat or chair conformer are tetrahedral and therefore also have two hydrogens attached to each of them, right? We haven't been drawing those. Um, but they're in general, they're going to have one of two directions. They're either going to be pointed in what we call the axial direction, which means more or less up and down relative to the plane of, of the um, hexagon. And if you think about this, this as being like the equator, that's, it's really similar to a globe. You just have to use your imagination because it's not a sphere. But if you think about having a axis of rotation that goes right through the middle of the ring, where it's going to rotate around, then axial means it's point it's pointed parallel to that that rotation, and equatorial means it's pointed away from, uh, roughly perpendicular to that angle of rotation. So and it, it works a little bit better if you think about it as being when it's in its totally flat, unrealistic. So just picture it as a regular hexagon. Point flat like this. If the, if the hexagon is the equator on the globe, then the axis of rotation is the North Pole and the South Pole. All right, so turning it into 3D makes it a little harder to visualize that. But again, the carbons are the equator. And up and down through the middle of the ring is the North and the South Pole. That's the axial direction. And so, so it's like opposite to a graph, X and Y. If you want to put it axial, um, where 
vertex is the I, I've always I've always associated these terms with the globe of the of the world. Right. Equatorial lends itself to that. So there's equatorial is around the belt. Uh, or it's like a belt going around the middle, and then axial is the other one. Right. Think about it that way. Yeah. Um, but whatever, however it helps you think about it, whatever works for you. The important thing is that each one of these carbons is tetrahedral, right? Which means each one of these carbons has, we're going to draw them as two bonds that are in the plane of the board, roughly, or parallel to the plane of the board, and then a bond out and a bond in. So for this top carbon here, the bond in is the bond going to that back carbon. The bond out is the wedge coming to this front carbon, which means the two hydrogens have to be in the plane of the board. Right? It's a tetrahedral structure. And so one of them, and remember that they have to be roughly 120 degrees from the bonds that go out and in, right? The bonds that go out and in are always roughly pointed in the same direction. And then 120 degrees from the, those are the two bonds that are in the plane of the board. So here's your equatorial hydrogen because it's pointed away from everything from the rest of the ring structure. And your axial hydrogen is the one that's pointed up and down. It's perpendicular to the plane of the molecule. It's kind of pointed towards everything else, right? Versus away from everything else. Every single one of these carbons has the two positions that aren't drawn when we just draw the skeletal structure, one of them is axial and one of them is equatorial because they're all going to be roughly, I mean, they're close to 109 degrees from, from each other, but round that to 90 for the sake of uh, turning everything into nice neat angles, they're close to perpendicular to each other, right? So if they're close to perpendicular to each other, one of them is going to be pointed with everything else and one's pointed away from everything else. And away from everything else is equatorial. So I assume like the meridian, say? Yeah, exactly. Go with, with the globe analogy. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm kind of done. Yeah. <laughs> so if we're drawing the axial versus the equatorial for the others, for the same, same process, of the two bonds that are shown, figure out if one's away from you, towards you, or flat and then figure out what the remaining two places are. So for this carbon in the front, one of the bonds is going into the board, right? Which means there's another one coming out of the board in roughly the same direction, right? That's the axial. No, I've messed up my color coding. I'm gonna to stick to black from drawing them and then I'll circle them in the right colors. So that one, and kind of want to draw it so that it's not totally overlapping, but it's more or less pointed in the same direction as that bond going into the board. And then that means that if this is our bond going back, this is our bond coming forward, our last two have to be flat, right? So there's a flat one. And the other one that's flat is basically straight down. So out of those, which one is going up and down and which one's going around the equator? First one is the equatorial part. Yeah. So there's our axial. And here's our equatorial. So I'm going to do the, the Next trickiest one, I'm going to erase all of those markings and do the one. The ones in the back, I think, are the hardest because you have to draw things around the stuff that's in the front without overlapping too much. Um, so I'm going to do that one, and then I'll let you, you all work on the last three to see if you can um, 
make it all make sense, practice doing this a little bit. So for this back one, from the point of view of this rear carbon, that headrest carbon is coming towards us, right? And then this one is flat. There's another one going away from us. It's roughly the same angle as the, the wedge coming towards us. And then, so then where's our last one going to be? Yeah. And I'm trying to draw it as a, so that it's not overlapping with this line. The bond wouldn't be that long. I should really look at what I'm writing when I write it, so it looks better. Um, so which of those is axial? The one that's pointing downward is axial. And the one that's pointing away from us is equatorial. Would it be similar logic for the other? Yeah, same exact logic. Identify the bonds that are drawn. Are they flat? Are they in towards you? Or are they away from you relative to that carbon? And then place the two remaining bonds to make that carbon tetrahedral. And then one it should be relatively obvious. Once you do that, if you did it right, one of them should stand out as being axial. And pretty much axial is usually the easier one to identify because axial is always going to be straight up and down, up or down rather. Right. And the one that's drawn into the border out of the board is going to be your equatorial. The recommendation I would have for these is don't be afraid to draw the molecule really big. Give yourself space because trying to draw things too cramped, for me at least, always winds up in me fixing things up. <clears throat> it's also a good chance to use a mixed ink and pencil. Get a really nice cyclohexane drawn in ink and then start using pencil for your drawing all the other bonds so that when you go from one part into the next, you can just erase.
All right, so let's do this one in the front first. So from the point of view of this front molecule, this, the footrest is going into the port, right? Which means there's another one in generally the same direction pointing towards us. Carbon to carbon armrest is flat. So our last flat one is going in the opposite direction than those. And again, it's more of 120, but for the sake of making everything look neat and making clear what's the axial, um, you can wind up drawing it straight up and down so you can see what's what. It's the important thing is it's pointed in the opposite direction from the other flat bond and from the two into the board and out. So which one's axial, which one's equatorial? Top one's axial. Sticking out. Equatorial sticking out. Okay. And the back one's going to look like the same, but reversed, right? Instead of having a bond a hydrogen pointed out towards us down and left, it's going to be pointed away from us. Over to the left. And that's going to be the equatorial. And the axial then goes straight up from there. Then the last one. You've got a bond coming towards us and a bond going away from us. So this, this one's an easy one, right? The last two bonds are the ones that are in the plane, roughly 120 degrees from everything else. Like that, right? Which one's axial, which one's equatorial? Bottom one's axial, this one's equatorial. So because all the axial ones basically go straight up and straight down um, and just away from the rest of the molecule, one of the easiest ways to do this is when you draw, if you need to draw these positions, is when you draw your cyclohexane, um, just start by drawing a line up or a line down from every carbon. And that's going to be your axial position. It's just going to be all of the axial ones are in the plane of the board either pointing down or up, depending on where the rest of the bonds are, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go through and draw your cyclohexane first, whichever method you're using to do it, just on every carbon, draw a vertical line pointed away from the rest of the bonds. Those are all your axials. And the equatorial goes in whatever direction's left. All right, so why does this matter? Why are we bothering to do this? Um, well, because it turns out axial versus equatorial is going to have different sterics when it com when it compares to um, pointing towards the rest of the molecule. So the second we add a substituent onto our cyclohexane, it's going to preferentially put that substituent in the position where it's going to have the fewest interactions. Because everything, anything that we're going to add on is going to be bigger than a hydrogen, right? So the second we have something that's not hydrogen, it's going to try and put that whatever it is that's not a hydrogen pointed away from everything else to minimize these interactions. So would we expect that to be axial or equatorial? Let's 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 we'll go back here again. Let's say we put a methyl group in the axial position here. Then we have these, these. Okay. 
if you put it in the axial position, it's kind of far away from these other hydrogens, but they're still kind of in the same direction, right? Put it in the equatorial position. Then the other equatorial carbons or the other equatorial positions are all pointed away from it. So in general, equatorial is going to minimize sterics. So the same way that when we had free rotation, we just put whatever was biggest anti relative to each other, right? Now we don't have free rotations, but we do have the ability to flip back and forth between the two different um, two different chair conformers because it turns out if we if we start with the methyl group in axial, if we go through that, we call it a chair flip, um, which sounds like a you know WWE move or something like that, um, skateboarding term maybe. Um, if you do a chair flip, if you take this the headrest and you put it down, and then you take this and pop it up, everything that was axial becomes equatorial, and everything that was equatorial becomes axial. Because picture doing this rotation, taking this flipping it downward, now all of a sudden, instead of it pointing up and down, you wind up with the hydrogen that was equatorial now is pointed downward instead of out. And the methyl that was pointed up and down is pointed away from everything else. Right, and so that means that when we draw, when we're drawing these molecules, we actually actually have three conformers. There's chair conformer, there's the boat conformer, and then there's the other chair conformer. As long as everything we're talking about is just hydrogen, then both the chair conformers are the same. But as soon as one of them is different, we're going to put whatever that, we're going to go through a chair flip to put whatever that larger substituent is in the equatorial position is going to be the most stable complement. So let's try it. I just drew you both chair compromers for, for methyl cyclohexane. Now y'all try it for bromocyclohexane. Start over since it's easy to erase with this. So, by convention, typically it's easier to see axial and equatorial, and it's easier to draw your substituents when you put them at one of the points rather than putting them at the armrest. But again, all of these are identical positions. So you could put the bromine anywhere you want it. The only thing you need to make sure you do is when you do that, to get both possible confirmations, one of them, you need to put the bromine axial and the other one, it has to be equatorial. And if you, but if you picture then taking this headrest and flipping it down to be the footrest, And then putting thing in the footrest and flipping it up. 
So I find it easily easiest to visualize this. You picture these four armrest carbons not moving. That's not physically how it's going to be. We can define our frame reference however we want. It's convenient, right? So all of these are constantly wiggling, but for the sake of drawing this, keep those the same and just flip the headrest and footrest. And now the bromine, the hydrogen that was on the, that's on the same carbon as the bromine is going to be the one that's pointed straight downward. The bromine's pointed out here, equatorial, away from everything else. It's a little bit harder to visualize, but these hydrogens wind up flipping. Um, flipping between axial and equatorial as well, because when this, when the headrest flips downward, now all of a sudden these ones basically kind of flip up a little bit like an umbrella flipping inside out. Like by forcing part of the molecule to go down, these ones trying to stay away from it rotate as well. Right, so it was the blue one is my um, pointer finger and the red one's my thumb. When you put the headrest down, these ones do that. Which means, again, these positions also flip axial. Everything flips axial to equatorial when you do a chair flip. Not just the end positions, those are just the easiest to visualize and draw. Would it be a different isomer if the bromine was like the chair didn't flip and the bromine was just the equatorial position? Is that a different isomer? Not until we add another substituent, because it's just a different complement of the same bromine. Because if you, you can picture taking this, this molecule, if you take this version and you flip it like a pancake, you can still put these four armrest carbons in the same spot, right? But now you've got the bromine and what we would arbitrarily call the headrest, but now equatorial. So it's still just a conformer. It's not until we add something else to the ring structure that we have to define that we we define both sides of the ring. They're either the same side of the ring or opposite sides of the ring. And that's when we start seeing those um, we call it cis versus trans. Trans meeting across, cis meeting the same. And so in that case, we could have something like. If we're just picturing it as being a flat hexagon, you have bromine pointed up towards you. And then on this, this side, let's say we're going to put a methyl. That would be the trans isomer because picturing it as though it's flat, you have a bromine above the ring and a, brom and a methyl below the ring versus and that's a different molecule than having the bromine above the ring and the methyl above the ring. Does that make sense? Yeah. But you need two things to define that. Without two substituents, then it's identical, regardless of which side you drew the bromine on. Right? And This is just, I just wanted to put this up there just to show um, and define this term. When you put it in the axial position and you wind up with them running into the other axial hydrogens, they call that a one three diaxial interaction. Because if you call this carbon one, that's carbon two, and then here's carbon three, that's when you get your other axial position pointed in the same way and they can wind up clashing with each other a little bit. It's not quite the same as saying eclipsed versus staggered, a similar logic. It would be the third on the other side too. It'd be the third and come the other way too, right? If they weren't symmetrical, then we'd have to call it a one, three, five diaxial um, interaction or something like that. But just in general, this diaxial interaction is referring to these kind of interactions where they're clashing with each other. And if you flip it, chair flip, put it in equatorial, you don't see those. All right.
Uh, we don't have a quiz before next lecture, so it doesn't matter where I stop right now. That's a good place to stop. We're already a few minutes over. Um, we'll start lab a couple minutes late to make up for it, give you guys your full hour. Um, so we'll start lab at five after. Um, but I'll have I'll have uh, printouts for you. And Zeke brought up that I didn't update the schedule on the, the syllabus online for which lab we're doing today. Um, so I'm going to go with whatever Mariola has set up which I think is the distillation lab, but if she set up the one that's supposed to be next week, then we're just going to flip the order since it doesn't really matter at this point. Yeah, I, I think either way, you're going to wind up doing a distillation. It's usually we do the distillation one first, but um, it might just mean that I do a little bit more demonstrating if we have it out of order. Something nasty lab, but it's it's a little.